we're gonna go ahead and get started. If you have questions, please put them in, in all caps and we will try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, let's see, let's get it started off with Dan, uh, Danielle Emberly is saying, how's your luck with the new bolt-on neck guitars? Uh, find you often have to loosen screws and push the neck into alignment. Okay. Um, um, you're asking as if I have a great deal of, of um, experience ripping necks off of guitars, and I really don't. I mean, I, I've got several bolt-ons. Um, this is a bolt-on neck, the, the, the new uh, uh, 66 Strat. Um, that is bolt-on. This is not. Um, these are not. The Fender Strats tend to be. The Telecaster I have is a bolt-on neck as well. And those work great. I mean, some people have, you know, think that they may be uh, uh, something that you need to adjust. I have personally never had any problems with my bolt-on neck guitars. Not even close, not even once, not even ever. So if you're having a problem with your bolt-on neck guitar, I would suggest you have that looked at by, by a, a fellow who knows guitars, because those should be rock solid. You, I mean, yes, you can, you know, you can switch out a neck or something, that's what they're there for. But once it's in place, it should not be moving around on you at all. So yeah, um, that would be um, something I would definitely check out. If that's moving on you or adjusting somehow, yeah, I would have that checked out, checked out there. Hey, Felicia is asking a good question. How long should you stay on one thing you were learning and how do you keep your mind on it? Felicia, you're reading, you're reading my script here of what we're going to cover here in a little bit. Um, how do you keep your focus? Focus. Here's, here's some thoughts on that. Um, what helps me keep my focus is uh, not be trying to do a bunch of things at once. I generally don't try and learn, oh, here's my list of 10 things I'm working on learning. I'll never learn any of them worth a darn if there's 10 of them. You focus on one, two, maybe three, tops. And, and then you can really dive into a topic. But if you're just kind of splitting up your practice time amongst too many variables, then you never actually get deep enough in your practice time to really get down to where the skill is. You're just kind of touching around the surface of it, learn a few patterns and things like that and think you know what's, what, what's going on. Um, that's, that's my, my thought on that. So how do you keep focused on it? For me, it's an issue of making sure my mind is fresh when I'm practicing. Uh, I don't want to practice when I'm tired. I don't want to practice when I'm distracted. Uh, I want my practice area to be a place free of distractions. I'm a distractible guy. So I, I, I know that's my tendency. And I know if I'm not really guarding my, my, myself during those times, I will have a tendency to get distracted and I will lose my focus. And what happens is that I just don't get deep enough into the concept to really under, understand and make progress on it. So limit your distractions. Make sure your practice place is a place that is purely devoted to just your, just your guitar. I mean, there's it's sure fun, you know, playing with your uh, guitar on your couch and stuff like that. And there's wonderful times that you can do that. But when, when you're trying to actually get something done in practice, try and have a spot that is devoted just to your practice. You have all your materials out and you're ready to go. That helps me to stay focused. If you're having problems, you know, just kind of remembering what I was at, what am I doing, write it down. Write it down. This, this is, you're trying to get something done. Practicing is not about spending time on something. It's about getting something done. So write it down. If, you, if you're working on learning these 10 exercises, then say on this date, I got through the first three. I had these, this tempo, stuff like that. Just start writing stuff down so that you can keep, uh, keep going. If something is not written down, if it's not measured, then it's really hard to see how you're making progress with it. So uh, that would be some things I would think to help you with, with uh, focus. Good question. Good, good question, something we all wrestle with. Too Speedy is asking, any rec recommendations for trusted fingerstyle patterns for modern songs in four, four, and six, eight time? Um, <laughs> four, four, and six, eight time. Very good. I, I was uh, I'm reminded of my own frailties. Uh, I was band leading at our church this weekend, and uh, 
the first song was in 6-8, and uh, we're getting ready to start it off, and I'm counting it off for the musicians, and I go, one, two, three, four! Well, the song's in 6-8, you know, so nobody knew what to do. I completely botched the whole thing because I wasn't paying attention to what song's in 4, what song's in 6-8. So as far as fingerstyle patterns, let me, hey, let's switch guitars here. Let's, uh, let me grab, grab my acoustic here. Fingerstyle patterns. Well, there's in 4-4, four, four, that's a duple, Two, uh, that is a duple based pattern. So I would want to do things that are in combinations of twos and fours and eights. So, so if I'm in a song in four, two, three, four, one, two, and three, four, and one. What finger pattern am I doing there? Look carefully, we'll have our producer, she's got a, a great shot there. Let me lower this mic so you can see a good shot on my hand there. I'm gonna do thumb, one, two, three, thumb, two, one, three. Okay, thumb, one, two, three, thumb, two, one, three. That is an eight stroke pattern, which works well in four, four. So I've kind of mixed thumb one, two, three, and thumb two, one, three, and I've created a pattern. So if I put it with some different chords, sorry. Here's some things to think about on that pattern. You want your bass, your thumb that's hitting the bass notes to be on a strong beat, which would be beats one, beats three, something like that. So what is actually on top, one, two, and three, what they're doing is less important. What's more important is what thumb he's doing. Thumb is doing, he's, and he's on strong beats, one, one, and three, something like that. So that whole pattern, my thumb was just going. And then the other ones were doing something else. So that's a little bit of a hint there. Now, if I wanted to do a pattern in 6-8, this would be a triplet-based pattern. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one. And here, all I'm doing here is thumb, one, two, three, two, one, thumb. Thumb, one, two, three, two, one, thumb, one, two, three, two, one. Kind of gets that da 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 thing going. That's the difference. A duple based pattern, you're going to end up with two, four, or eight uh, notes in the pattern, and, and thumb is emphasizing the stronger beats, generally beats one and three. Uh, on a triplet based pattern, for like for six, eight, uh, thumb would hit the first. Sometimes it'll even hit the fourth one. But that gets a little repetitive after a while. So sometimes it's good to kind of arpeggiate up and down. And I'll give you a couple of patterns there. So hopefully that helps to you. Um, <laughs> three, four. Uh, I remember I played a gig. Gosh, I forget this guy's name. This is back in San Antonio. And uh, he would call me for certain just odd jobs. Uh, he was kind of a schmoozer. And so he would find himself in these places of doing these strange things. So anyway, I got called to play this it was, it was at a restaurant, a small little restaurant in uh, San Antonio. And uh, I was in college at the time. 
and uh, it was a little pub sort of a thing, Irish pub. So we were doing all this Irish music. Well, none of it's written down, and it's all, you know, in this six, eight, three, four. That kind of stuff. And it's just me and him, and I think there may have been a clarinet player or something who knew what was going on. It was, it was a, I was hanging on for dear life. I screwed up terribly. And, uh, and I remember because the professor, the head of the choral department at the university I was taking, uh, I was going to at that time, just came in there with his wife, girlfriend, or whatever, and they sat right down in front. It's a small old place. They sat right down in front of us. And here I'm just botching these Irish songs all night long in 3, 4, and 6, 8. Um, <laughs> I forget who that guy was, but we did a lot of gigs together. Uh, Dan is saying, looking for some information on modes, how to use them in soloing. Okay, um, we, did a, we did a lesson on modes. Uh, just kind of type in guitar gathering and my name and modes and you'll, you'll find it. Uh, basically modes in, in 20 seconds here. In, 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 any, in any key, the, the pattern of like a major scale is a combination of a certain amount of tones, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And usually we go from C to shining C, from root all the way up to the top octave, okay? And that is a specific uh, combination of half steps and whole steps. Now, but I can adjust that. So take those same notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and start on a different note. So instead of going from C to C, I'm gonna go, let's say, from D to D. Same notes, so I'm not doing a D major scale. I'm doing the same notes as I was doing a C major scale. I'm just going from D to D. So you end up with a minor mode. This would be a Dorian mode. And, uh, and so there's different exotic names for them as you, as you go through the Phrygian and Lydian and Mixolydian and Aeolian and Locrian and uh, finally Ionian, which is a major scale. So as you're going, you can go to D to D and then E to E and F to F and they all have a different little bit of a quality of a sound about them. How do you apply them to soloing? Good question. All right, I'm going to switch, let me switch back to electric because I've, I've got a little looper here. So let's say, okay, so let's say, uh, let's say I've got a little groove going on here and I'm gonna be, in the key of C, but I'm going to go from an F to a G. So I'm in the key of C, but I'm going to go from an F major to a G major. Uh, and let me see if I can do it. Two, three, four. Actually, that's too fast. Let me let me slow it down so you can get the progression a little bit better. Two, three, four. Okay, so this is an F major 7th to a G. What do I solo over? Well, they're both in the key of C, so I can just play anything in C. in modes, I would think of like an F Lydian, which would be, it's still an F to F, but it's not an F major scale because we're in the key of C, so it's an F, G, A, B natural, C, D, E, F. at this point is, Steve, how did you know? How did you know to go into the key of C and play an F Lydian? How did you know that? Because the key of C is the only key that has an F major seventh and a G major in it. 
Ah, so I've got to know the pattern of chords in any key. If I was in the key of F major, I'd have an F major 7 and a G minor. Ah, but the fact that it was a G major tipped me off that that must be in a different key. So I'm not in the key of F. If I just normally looked at that, an F and a G, I would think, oh, I'm first chord's in F, I'm in F. No, 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 no. I'm in the key of C because C is the only key that has an F major and a G major in it. So how did I know that? Am I a musical genius? No, you just gotta know your scales and the, the, the chords that go in those scales. So go back to that modes lesson. I think there's even a PDF that goes along with that. It's all free, just look it up. And, uh, and, and you have to know, you have to analyze the chords that you're looking at are supposed to solo over and then you apply the mode that those chords fit into. So, and it's not always as simple as as, um, um, you know, oh, the first chord's the root chord, not always. I was playing a thing today. Uh, it was a, uh, let me clear this loop out. Um, it was in G minor, and so it was something like this. Two, chicka, three, chicka, four, chicka. to look at that in G minor and go, oh, okay, well let's say I'm in the key of uh, F, because the G minor is in the key of F. Ah, but that wouldn't work out right because I got a G minor and a C minor is both in there, and a C minor is not in the key of F. The only key that is in a G minor and a C minor, or one of the keys, would be a um, uh, the key of B flat. So if I play in the key of B flat, around here. Okay, sounds great. I'm in the key of B flat. Now, those two chords also appear in the key of E flat. Ooh, tricky, tricky. So then I would be playing in the Phrygian mode, and it's gonna sound a lot different. It's still gonna work, but it's gonna sound a lot different. Now I'm gonna play in Phrygian. You hear that, how that note doesn't work? Ah. So you have to kind of determine which, which uh, key you're in. And the fact that it, it later on went to a third chord, which is a D7, is what kind of honed me in that we were in the relative minor of the key of B flat. Lots of theory there. If you're a little fuzzy on your theory, go back. We have a whole series on how music works. And uh, lots of, you can learn all about your keys and key signatures and all that sort of stuff. Paul Foytak, any advice on acoustic guitar humidica humidification and you need a large t-shirt. Okay, I'll remember the large t-shirt part. Okay, humidification on an acoustic guitar um, is important. Uh, let's say you live in, oh, someplace extreme, Phoenix. Let's say you live in Phoenix and you love playing your guitar out on your back porch and you just love it so much you wanna just leave your guitar out on your back porch in Phoenix. That's a bad idea, okay? The humidity is so low there that it, your guitar is really, I know it looks fancy, but it really is just a piece of wood. And even though you've got finish overall here on the inside, it's, it's unfinished. So all of that is very susceptible to the humidity in the air. So if I'm in a very dry environment, the little water that is in here, uh, just naturally in the wood, starts to go out of there and therefore the wood starts to contract. Next thing you know you've got your the ends of your frets are sharp and uh, 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 your guitar is you know the action of your guitar is a little funky all that sort of stuff. Same thing will happen if you live in the Amazon okay you live in the you live in the Amazon forest and you love playing your guitar outside of your hut at night in the Amazon. Yeah same problem in reverse. There, there's so much water in the air that your guitar is way too humid. Generally, uh, here, uh, you're gonna have problem, more problems with your guitar being too dry 
than too wet. Um, it's not it's not something that I generally worry about all the time. Oh my goodness, in my case, and 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 is that everything? And it has to be exactly 42%. No, I generally don't worry about it uh, too much. You just want to be careful and not go to extremes. If you're really hot, really cold. If you're really dry. If you're really uh, humid and wet, um, that would be bad. <laughs> Good friend of ours. He loved the look of a of a guitar next to a roaring, next to his fireplace with a roaring fire. <laughs> wow. After a winter of that roaring fire, that guitar being next to the roaring fires, it was as brittle as kindling because it just sucked all the moisture out of that. So be careful. If you're, if you're, if you know your natural situation is a little bit on the dry side and let's say you get to winter time and all you have is hot, dry air blowing through your house, yeah, throw on a little humidifier. And if you feel your skin getting dry, if you feel your hands getting dry, if you feel the fret ends starting to, to uh, uh, poke out and be sharp, those are little signs that your guitar is telling you it is too dry and they need some humidity. So, um, Irene is saying, please demonstrate how to use a pick and at the same time finger pick with the last three fingers. All right, hybrid picking is what this is called in the biz. All right, so I'm gonna have my pick here. See if we can get a shot of this. I can have my pick between thumb and my index, just like normal, okay? And that leaves my middle finger, my ring finger, um, and your pinky, although I don't use my pinky. So you're kind of, you're left with basically three things I can adjust. Thumb and index is, is holding the pick. So the only thing that's left is middle and ring, okay? <laughs> So I can play it all with my pick, or I can start incorporating these others in there. I'll slow it down so you can see. Now that may be unfamiliar, you know, to you, to your hand, but it's a great style. I use it all the time. What I like about using that, that hybrid picking is because you can get um, a lot of force with the pick, and you can, but you still get the dexterity with the uh, the uh, um, with the uh, uh, fingering. So uh, the the Ron Block tune I was playing a little bit earlier, uh, uh, the swing. So I'm using kind of a hybrid thing. So it's a great style. If you're not used to it, just kind of start to do some, you know, little patterns with it. start some simple patterns there I'm just using th uh, thumb and index and my ring finger or sorry my yeah my ring finger maybe I can alternate them maybe thumb and uh, middle and ring see how I'm alternating slow down It takes a little bit of practice because you often have kind of a jumping thing happening with your with your picking uh, uh, the thumb and the index that are doing kind of a jumping thing to cover what normally would be a finger picking thing. So good question, lots of good questions today. Okay, let me get tuned back up here. Uh, we'll get to some more questions here in just a second. Um, let me make an, an announcement or two. Uh, we talked uh, about the fing fall finger style retreat. Okay, I know it's hot and muggy and, and all that sort of stuff, but something's around the corner. It's going to be great. It is fall, and it's going to start getting mercifully cooler 
uh, around here, and Tennessee is just a fabulous place in the fall. And so we started this about, oh, I don't know, probably six years ago. I had a couple years off for COVID, but about six years ago, I wanted to do kind of a different event. And this is uh, not a big conference with a bunch of workshops and you're going from room to room and bands and all that sort of stuff. That's our summer uh, event. This is a different thing. This is a smaller event. I think we can fit 22, 23 people in it. It's sold out the last uh, three or four years that we've had it. And um, we go to this wonderful retreat center outside of Nashville. And you're, you know, sitting on a big leather couch 10 feet away from Phil Kagey. Uh, he's play as he's playing a little private concert for us. That sort of stuff. And you're getting it. It kind of takes the whole stage and distance between you and the player out of the equation. So it's just you're sitting a few feet away from these amazing players, and I just love that environment. You're able to ask them questions, and it takes all of the the lights and the star and 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 he's a big shot. It takes it all out of the way, and it's just you and another guy trying to play, trying to figure out how to play this wonderful instrument. So. Uh, we do this every year. This is our uh, uh, fall fingerstyle retreat this year. Uh, we have Thomas Lieb, a great uh, fingerstyle guitarist out of uh, California. Um, and he does a lot of covers of songs, just brilliant stuff. Uh, he's been with uh, Candy Rat Records as well. We've got um, Walter Rodriguez Jr. is going to be with us. Wonderful jazz arrangements, just uh, these solo jazz fingerstyle arrangements. Uh, he is going to be with us from Miami. Uh, I've talked to Bill Cooley, legendary sideman here in Nashville. He is going to be with us, um, Kathy Matea's sideman for years, and just a brilliant player and brilliant fingerstyle. The, all three of them very different in their approaches to it. And I'm, I'm trying to get another one too. We tried to get Christy Lene, but actually she's, uh, we couldn't work it out with her schedule. So I'm trying to get another guy who I've just become familiar with. His name is Matt Thomas. He was the fingerstyle champion. Um, a few years back. So I'm going to try and get Matt to be with us as well. So anyway, it's great. If you're interested, check it out. Fingerstyleretreat.com. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic event. So it'll give you all the stuff there. Uh, there's an early registration discount that expires on September 1st. So if you're going to come, um, don't, don't hesitate, you know, to sign up because September 1st, it'll, uh, it'll go up a hundred bucks. So there you go. Um, what else do I need? Oh, uh, next week. Thank you, Paulette. Uh, next week's live lesson. We're very excited to have uh, Paulo Oliveira, again, from Belmont University. And he's going to be bringing with him um, a Brazilian guitar maker. And uh, so he's going to be, and we're going to be at back at Groons. But here's the big thing. We're going to be doing some jazz stuff. It's going to be great, but it's going to be on Monday. Everybody say Monday, not Tuesday, Monday. I'll send you out an email. So next Monday, not Tuesday, Monday, we will be doing a special Monday edition of Live Lessons from Groons with Paulo. Me and Paulo will be playing some jazz standards, and it'll be great to do some jazz duet things. Uh, and then uh, we'll be hearing from this Brazilian uh, guitar maker. So it should be a fascinating show. So anyway, that's coming up on next Monday of next week. Also want to let you know, hey, one of the reasons why I didn't get out the email too uh, quickly uh, today or till, till it was so late is because I was having lunch with our good friend Dino Paston. So uh, I had lunch with Dino. He's doing great. Uh, so many of you had asked about Dino. Dino had a stroke about... Uh, um, maybe four, five, six months ago now. It's been, it's been a while. And um, he is slowly recovering uh, on his left side, which has become weaker. So uh, all of his faculties are still there. You still talk to him. It's just like Dino. Um, but he is uh, getting used. Every time I see him, which isn't very often um, because of his schedule, it used to be all the time, but now it's just uh, 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 he's not able to do that as much. And uh, he's you know, another major development. So this time he was walking pretty well. Um, he's, uh, he's getting use of his left hand again with individual fingers. He can't, uh, can't play piano just yet with his left hand, play fine with his right hand. But, uh, um, so we were joking, you know, bass players always say for the piano player not to play with their left hand anyway. So it's probably, probably good. Make all the bass players happy. Anyway, Dino wanted me to make sure and let you all know he's doing fine. He appreciates all your 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 uh, thoughts, your prayers, your well wishes to him. And it was just great to see him. And he's doing well. We had a pizza and he was 
doing great. So anyway, uh, that's that's uh, a little bit of Dino. Glad to see uh, Dino doing well. So, hey, let's give something away. We haven't given anything away, away yet. Um, I wanted to give away a pumping nylon book. Uh, f uh, kind of a finger style classical guitar. It's got the Giuliani studies in it. Uh, the Terrega are... Uh, Terrig, excuse me, arpeggio exercises, and then there's all kinds of uh, musical pieces, Bach and other stuff, a little bit more classical oriented. A great book, uh, a great, great book. The Classical Guitarist Technique Handbook by Scott Tennant, uh, one of the uh, founders of the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet. So um, somebody's about to win this. The winner of this is Camper Star. Camper Star, you have officially won a pumping nylon book. Hey, send me your information, though, at service at guitargathering.com. Service at guitargathering.com. Your mailing address, your screen name, what you won, things like that. And we will uh, send this out to you. I'll send this out to you tomorrow. So congratulations. That's lots of fun. Um, all right. Hey, I wanted to play. We got some more questions there. This is great. Uh, but I wanted to play... Um, Oh, okay. Oh, you or she is from Tokyo. Wow. Okay. Well, we will have to figure out how to get this to Tokyo for you, Camper Star. Glad you're here. Um, I want to um, play um, a song for you guys, and we're going to use this new guitar. Um, uh, this is a 1966 uh, Stratocaster. Um, hey, my birth year. I was born in 1966. Those those strats, uh, Fender strats, those 60, 65, 66, 67, right in there is kind of the sweet spot of uh, Stratocasters and Fenders. So this was the uh, 1966 um, version of it. A couple of pieces of it. It's not completely uh, all 1966. The neck is a 1966 neck, and you can tell by the odd-shaped uh, headstock on it that only happened in the, that year. Um, so you'll you'll see when you see that headstock, you'll know that it's, that's a um, uh, an original there. All the electronics are original 1966 electronics. Uh, the one thing that's not original is the body. The body is a uh, um, it's actually it, meant, it looks relic. It looks like it's vintage, but it's actually just a relic uh, body. And Greg Voros himself put this amazing instrument together. Guthrie Trap had it for a while, and um, um, and then so now I'm trying it out for a while. So it's it's kind of fun. I must admit, is it is a. Uh, I played it this weekend, and it did get a really really great sound. So uh, particularly with this. Uh, my uh, uh, Octonaut hyperdrive pedal. Let me stop that. So it got it got a real good gritty sound. switch is all they had back then so here's the uh, neck pickup uh, middle pickup and then the the uh, bridge so I thought I would play a little bit of a uh, sleepwalk um, the great song by uh, Santo and Johnny, uh, who were brothers. It was released in August, playing all these August songs. It was released in August of 1959. Uh, and oddly enough, won a Grammy by when Brian Setzer did it in 1998, his best pop instrumental song. So kind of a famous instrumental song. And I thought it might be fun to play uh, an old song on this guitar. 1966. That was a great year. That was a year I took my first breath in 1966, so it's uh, fun. So anyway, so we're gonna. I've got found a little track to this, and so we'll see if uh, see if I can make some music with it.
there you go. A little bit of a, a sleepwalk there. Um, on a 1966 Fender Strat. What a gorgeous sounding instrument. So, there you go. All right, uh, get back to a couple of questions and then uh, we'll play us out. Um, uh, Paul is saying, I play rhythm. How do I spice up open and bar chords? Okay, let me... Uh, rhythm. Are, Paul, let me ask you a question. Paul, maybe you could answer. Uh, are you playing rhythm on acoustic or electric? So he'll have to answer down there. So while Paul is answering, um, acoustic or electric is what kind of rhythm playing are you doing? Um, Joseph Martinez says, I was six when that song, when Sleepwalk was, was uh, released. So there you go. Uh, Tellaru said, yeah, I was playing in several garage bands playing the music of that era. All right. So I don't know if he was playing um, um, electric or acoustic. So let's, since I have my electric, let's, let's talk electric here first. So he's playing, he's talking about rhythm guitar. And how do I do something different? with uh, with rhythm. Okay. I would suggest everybody's always the normal default is to go open. You know, Steve, I'm I'm tired of playing open chords. Yes, don't play open chords. Uh, unless you're in a bluegrass band, try and avoid open chords. So if I'm playing um, rhythm, what else can I do on a C chord? Oh, man, the world is your oyster. You can do anything on a C chord, okay? Well, first of all, think of it differently. A C is not this. A C is a combination of tones. That's a C. That's a C. That's a C. That's a C. So I could choose all... Hey, this is a C. Hey, this is a C. How about this? How about this? That's a C. They're all C's, okay? So you can you can choose which one you want to do. So instead of just going... I saw somebody mention La Bamba there. That would be the standard thing to do. Now, what else could you do? Well, play inversions of those chords. C chord. How did I know this? I'm in my musical genius? Nope, these are just triads. We did a whole series on these. F, G, so I can throw a little groove for that. Oh, it's slow and flowy? Sure, no problem. Hey, what if I did Sleepwalk? So I could just go. But that's sometimes that's too heavy and too ponderous. So I can think of another part. And I like to do inversions. If I wanted to do something a little bit more up. Going back to our La Bamba. What if I just did uh, uh, two notes? Hey, uh, what if I that's what if I just wanted to do a little groove? I'm just noodling around on a C, a G, and an A. So the game, um, harmonically, and the game within your mind is to not play open chords. Okay, you just want to play something else. You know, what if I did... Uh,
kinds of things rather than just the standard open chords. Hope that gives you some ideas. Okay, uh, uh, another question or two, then we'll be kind of uh, wrapping this thing up. What if you have no fingerstyle abilities? Is it still something to go to? Uh, Brian, great question. Here's my thoughts on, on um, if you want to be a, it's always a good idea to be a well-rounded player. Let me just say that. I don't, I don't want to say you need to, oh, you need to drop everything if you're a fingerstyle player and be, you know, Eddie Van Halen. If it's a style you're not interested in, that sort of stuff. I get it. You want to kind of specialize in some things. But having said that, if you want to be a more rounded player, then you got to know at least a little bit in some of these other styles. And if you're a fingerstyle player, I'd say play with a pick sometimes. If you're an only pick player, I'd say play fingerstyle uh, and do hybrid picking. Just something else, something else, something else to constantly expand your, your um, um, what you can do. Sometimes I use fingerstyle and hybrid picking all the time, not some of the time, almost all the time I'm doing some sort of a hybrid picking um, thing. So it's just a style that you use a lot and I play a lot of finger style as well. So I'm constantly jumping between these. So I would say if you're, you don't want to be completely unfamiliar with a style because someday you're going to be sitting around a campfire and folks are going to say, hey, you play guitar? Great. Um, can you, can you play us something or play us while we sing some songs? And you're going to go, sure, let me grab my guitar and you're going to play fingerstyle and you're going to go. And they're going to go, we can't hear you, we can't hear you. See, that's when it's good to have a pick to go. You just sometimes for volume, you need to do it. So, um. Oh, you're asking about the fingerstyle retreat, my lovely wife corrected me. Uh, if you have no fingerstyle abilities, is this still something to go to? If you're interested in learning about fingerstyle, I can't think of a better place to do it than five feet away from some of the best fingerstyle players on the planet. You'll get a good dose of, of um, fingerstyle and what it's about uh, by just immersing yourself in it. So I always encourage people, if, you wanna, if you're interested in a particular style, then go immerse yourself in it for a while. Um, that, that would be how to, how to handle that. Um, uh, Peter's asking, is the, is the live lesson going to be at the same time on Monday? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, <laughs> Rick, uh, uh, Shuker is saying, get Doyle Dykes and I'll be there. Hey man, wouldn't it be great? I'll have to call Doyle up. Um, yeah, I'll have to call Doyle. That's a good idea. Uh, he doesn't live here. He used to live in Nashville, but now he lives, I think out in the Chattanooga area. So, um, uh, we'll see if we can, uh, um. Um, that's a good idea. I haven't thought about Doyle in a while. Might be good to, good to do that. Um, kind of does the Merle Travis Chad Atkins thing. Just so, what a brilliant player. So, um, okay. I wanted to close, and any last questions before I close this out with something? Camper Star is saying, Steve, how do you feel about the relaxation of the fingers on the left hand when you're finger picking? I feel that's a lot of harmony and balance when you're in total relaxation uh, between the left fingers, left hand, and you're thinking it feels a lot harmony. Okay, a lot of relaxation really on both is, is, is definitely in your picking hand, you need to be relaxed. Uh, you can get, it's easy to get tensed up, but you get the wrong kind of a sound when you're tensed up. You need to relax your picking hand. But your fretting hand, Um, there's a relaxed part of it, but there's also camper. There's also a, what I'm finding just for me personally, something I'm working on is hand strength. Now, two different, two different things. How can you be relaxed and strong? You need to be strong and you need to be relaxed. So I can't be strong and tense or weak and tense. I need to be strong in my hand and then, um, well, that way it, it allows me to be more fluid when I'm when I'm playing. Mm -hmm. 
all this kind of fast stuff. All, all that kind of fast stuff comes when, when I'm when my hand is strong. If I haven't been practicing, uh, my hand just gets you know temporarily weaker. And uh, but if I've been practicing a good bit, like right now, well, I currently do uh, the arpeggio exercises that we talked about. I don't know several months ago. I try and do two keys and all the arpeggio exercises every day, not to become brilliant but just to keep my hand strong. And if my hand is strong, then I find out everything works and I can play relaxed and I can play everything I need to play. Mike is saying, when do you want to have lunch? Hey Mike, I'd love to have lunch with you. Come on buddy, and you live here in town now. Let me know. I am, I am up, I'm up for that. Hey, uh, let me play a little bit of um, uh, my baritone guitar just because I want to. It's just a great guitar and I don't get to play it. Ah, such, such a low growly instrument. I love it. Um, so let me, let me play us out here for a little bit. If you're interested in the Fingerstyle Retreat, check that out at fingerstyleretreat.com. That'll get you all the information there. Um, the um, uh, live lesson next week is on a Monday. Remember that. Um, the, also, you might check out, we did a, for some reason, YouTube uh, is really, um, there's a whole lot of activity on a, on a video I did a couple years ago about the super arpeggio. Uh, Larry Carlton's Suapu Arpeggio and how to solo using that concept. And uh, if you're interested, check that out. For some reason, that's getting uh, recommended to a lot of folks these days. So um, this is a uh, fingerstyle um, version of What a Wonderful World. And I thought I would play it on my baritone. It's a little low on baritone, but I, I just wanted to do it for fun, just for me. So... Um,
you go. A little bit of uh, what a wonderful world to close us out. Hey, thank you guys. Keep up the uh, great work in your learning. You know, it's not about conquering a bunch of different things. Um, I was reminded today, it's not about the accumulation of information, uh, making music. Um, it's, you know, it's not like you, I know the temptation is if you just watch that next YouTube video, if you get that next Instagram reel, that uh, that's going to be the tip that's going to do. That's kind of, we have a, a whole world. It's, it's a, we're, we've got width for miles, but we have no depth. So beware of the trap of just accumulating information and not really diving deep enough into one concept, focusing like we talked earlier, uh, focusing till you can get, till you can get the transformation that you're looking for in the in your own playing. So keep up the great work. Your music matters, and we will see you guys next time.